Hello, and welcome to part three of our lecture from chapter 13 on fluid. In this uh, final part of our lecture, we'll be looking at fluid dynamics. So fluid dynamics uh, deals with fluids in motion. This is in contrast to the first parts of this video uh, where we dealt with fluid statics, which was uh, fluid at rest. Um, for example, this is a uh, three-dimensional computer simulation of air flowing around a moving car. And uh, engineers and car designers um, use simulations like this to see what the aerodynamics of the car are, to see how much drag there is on the car and the effects of the um, air flowing over the car. So um, what we're going to be um, using in this um, chapter or this portion of the chapter is uh, the concept of an ideal fluid and uh, the ideal fluid model. And um, this is just, these are some, um, basically some approximations that make things a lot easier to analyze. And the ideal fluid model, um, like all models, um, it's not necessarily perfect, but it can help explain a lot of the uh, properties and characteristics of fluid dynamics without getting into um, the really heavy detail that was, uh, would be found in a more uh, advanced course on fluid dynamics. So one of the characteristics of ideal fluids is that we will treat the fluid as incompressible. Um, that means the fluid has a constant density because it can't be compressed. And this is, um, for a fluid like water, this is a, a fairly uh, reasonable approximation. Water is, for the most part, an incompressible fluid. Uh, we're also going to assume that the fluid has no viscosity. Uh, viscosity is in internal friction that impedes the flow of fluid. So for example, honey is a very viscous fluid. It has high viscosity compared to water. Um, you know, honey, if you pour, uh, try to pour honey out of a jar, it, you know, would take, uh, it could take minutes for that honey to, to flow out of the jar, whereas water, because of its um, low viscosity, will flow out very quickly. Um, the other thing that we will be assuming um, in this part of the lecture is steady state or what is called laminar flow. Um, that means that the fluid flow at any given point remains constant over time. There's no change in speed or direction. Um, the sort of the opposite of steady state or laminar flow um, is called turbulent flow or turbulence. And um, this, uh, these illustrations down here sort of show the difference. Um, this is again, this is showing a, a, a high performance car being tested in a wind chamber. And um, this is what uh, the, some of the designers and engineers of the car uh, can use instead of having the car going out on the track and actually having to, you know, drive 200 miles an hour, um, they can put it in a wind chamber and shoot the air over the car at 200 miles an hour. And what they have are some smoke, um, basically sources of smoke or vapor that shoot across uh, in this wind chamber and they show the flow of air as it goes over and around the car. And you can see these, um, these flow lines out in front of the car um, are nice and clean. Um, this represents laminar flow. These are like, you can think of these of layers of air flowing over the car. And you can see how as it goes over the car, you know, the layers of airflow are uh, changing, you know, uh, shape to match that of the car. But one thing you can notice is that behind the car, these nice clean laminar uh, layers of airflow are um, distorted and we see turbulence. And so this is where we've lost the, the laminar flow uh, behind the car. Um, when uh, air flows over an airplane wing, this is the cross section of an airplane wing, we can also see examples of laminar flow um, underneath the wing and maybe way above it. But right along the surface of the wing, there might be some turbulent flow. And, and we're not gonna deal with uh, turbulent flow in this course. Um, this is another interesting picture here. This is showing, uh, it looks like a tennis ball and it's in a wind chamber again. So the tennis ball is being held um, on a stand 
and the uh, air is you know flowing around the tennis ball this this is to model what the tennis ball would be doing as it moves through the air and again you can see laminar flow you can see these nice clean flow lines out in front of the tennis ball but after they go around the ball the the lines uh, become turbulent the first um, thing we're going to do here with fluid dynamics is deal with uh, fluid flow and what's called the continuity equation. So this is the fluid flow equation of continuity. Um, basically, what, it's, what it deals with is if you have a fluid flowing through um, a pipe or a hose, and let's say one end of the hose where the fluid is flowing into is bigger or wider than the other end of the hose where it gets narrow. So you can see it tapering down in size here. And so what fluid, uh, the fluid flow equation of continuity says is that the volume of fluid entering here has to equal the volume of fluid leaving here during every second, let's say, for some interval of time. And the reason for this, again, is because the fluid is not allowed to be compressed. So if the fluid can't be compressed, then whatever fluid goes in here must come out here, all right, with the same um, amount of time. So um, what we can do here is a little bit of math. Um, we can say that the fluid flows a distance V1 times delta t, because remember distance is velocity times time, uh, during time delta t. So um, this is our um, input uh, area here, cross-sectional area, we'll call that A1, and the fluid speed here is V1. Um, that same amount of fluid has to leave over here. So here we have V2 times delta T, all right, the same time interval, and a different and smaller area here. So if we're going to equate these volumes here, in other words, volume is the area times the width of this little section here. So A1, V1, delta T, that's the volume of fluid shown shaded right here. That has to equal the volume of fluid leaving the hose on the smaller end, which is A2 V2 times delta T. And of course, these delta T's cancel because we're using the same interval of time, for example, one second. So what we're left with is just a simple relationship here. The area over here times the speed of the fluid here is equal to the area here, A2, times V2, the speed here. So um, what this tells us is that the fluid flow speeds up when the flow tube narrows, all right? So in other words, if A2 is made smaller than A1, then in order for this equation to, to hold true, V2, the speed V2 over here, must be greater than the speed over here because these two products have to be equal. Um, uh, we can say also um, that the fluid flow must slow down when the flu to uh, tube widens. So let's do an example here just showing some numbers. This is a example, um, an application of this uh, fluid continuity equation, which is for a high-speed nozzle. And you may have seen um, nozzles like this at the end of a garden hose. Instead of the water just, you know, coming out like a nice, thick, slow stream out of the end of the hose, when you put the nozzle on there, the water shoots out at a very fast, um, you know, like a jet. So um, in our problem here, it says water flows through a hose with a cross-sectional area of 15 square centimeters with a speed of three meters per second. The hose is connected, and so that's over here. Um, the hose is connected to a nozzle, that's this uh, guy here, um, with a spout area of just one square centimeter. So this is the 15 square centimeters here. It's thick, and then it um, basically narrows down in the nozzle to this really small opening here. This is A2. Um, and we want to know what speed does the water here leave the nozzle. So from our previous equation, we have A1V1 equals A2V2. So let's solve for V2, which is the output velocity of the water. So V2 is obtained just by dividing everything over here by A2. So we get V2 is the ratio of the areas A1 to A2 multiplied by the 
um, the initial velocity of the water over here. So we can put our numbers in here. A1 is 15 square centimeters. A2 is one square centimeter. So, and then of course our initial velocity here was given as three meters per second. So we have 15 over one. So this is our, our speed multiplication factor. This is the ratio of areas. It's, it's a ratio of 15. So we have 15 times three is 45 meters per second. So the water is coming out of the hose, out of the nozzle, 15 times faster because the area that it's being pushed through is 15 times smaller. Here are a couple more um, examples of the continuity equation. We just talked about the high-speed nozzle um, in the last um, a slide where we have water, you know, slowly moving into this end and then coming out fast. Um, another one is if you take a faucet and let the water um, flow out of the faucet, it's kind of interesting. You can see it in this picture here. Remember, the water is in free fall. It's falling due to gravity. So it's accelerating and it's speeding up as it falls. So up here, the stream of water is slow and down here, the stream of water is fast. But because of fluid continuity, the same volume of water leaving the faucet up here has to be hitting the sink down here. So the stream here where it's going slow must be wide and conversely, the stream down here where it's going fast must be narrow. And you can see the stream gets skinnier and skinnier as the water speeds up here. Um, another example um, is for uh, when a river um, narrows. If, assuming the river is, you know, at a, like a, a constant slope, if the river narrows, the water has to flow faster through the narrows, and this can cre create rapids. Let's now um, take a look at, uh, this is actually the last uh, topic for this chapter. Uh, we're gonna look at uh, something called Bernoulli's equation and the Bernoulli effect. Let's start by, uh, let me just do a, uh, ask you a question here. Suppose I had a couple of empty, these are supposed to be empty water bottles here, hanging from strings, and they're fairly close together, maybe one or two inches apart. Um, what do you think would happen if um, you or, or me or anyone else blew air through in between these two bottles. In other words, you put your face, you know, right up close to these bottles and you blow air through here. Um, what do you, what would you predict would happen to these bottles? Um, you know, or anything, would anything happen? Um, a lot of uh, people would predict that the bottles are going to move apart because we're forcing more air in between that's going to somehow create pressure that pushes outward on the bottles. But it's very interesting that this is exactly the opposite of what happens. What actually happens when we do this demo is that these two bottles actually move together. And the reason for this is called the Bernoulli effect. So we'll talk about in the next several slides, um, we'll talk about why that happens. And we'll also get to see a demonstration of this along with several other very interesting um, uh, demonstrations of the Bernoulli effect. We'll start by deriving uh, something called Bernoulli's equation. And it's a, a, a somewhat complicated equation. Um, both uh, the derivation is a little bit uh, complicated and the result is also a little bit complicated. But the good news is that once we get the result, um, we'll be able to uh, simplify it significantly for certain applications um, that will uh, show us the importance of it and also lead us to um, the so-called Bernoulli effect. So um, the idea behind Bernoulli's equation, it's sort of, a, it, it's basically involves if you had a flow tube like this of fluid, and let's say the fluid starts down here where the flow tube is wide, and the tube actually goes up, all right? It's going up in height and getting narrower like this. So um, as this fluid flows through this tube, we're going to 
analyze this from a work and energy perspective using some of the theorems that we've already learned in this course. So the, the one of the ideas here is that if we think about you know fluid constantly flowing through this flow tube here, this um, fluid that is in this shaded region here has to eventually end up up here in this shaded region here. And this is, has to do with the fluid continuity equation that we just talked about in the last couple of slides. So um, the net effect, one way to think about this is that this fluid that started down here, we're basically taking that and putting it up here. And that's sort of the, the you know, the net uh, effect, whereas all the other fluid in the tube is sort of just, we can think of it as just remaining where it's at, because remember the fluid is continuously flowing through here. So um, we can use the work energy theorem that we learned um, previously uh, for contact forces, that the, the work done by an external or contact force is equal to delta K, which is the change in kinetic energy, plus delta U, the change in this, this is gravitational potential energy. All right, so what's doing the work here? Well, pressure. So pressure is pushing on the, the liquid down here with, uh, you know, this is P1, this is the pressure down here, and this is P2, the pressure pushing back in the other direction up here. So the work done by P1, work is force times distance, and remember force is pressure times area. So we have P1A1 times the distance X1. So we're basically taking this um, amount of fluid here and we're moving it this distance here x1 so um, and by the way a1 and x1 um, this is V all right this is the volume of this fluid element here all right the area times the width of the of the uh, volume and then the same thing applies up here the work done by pressure P2 is force times distance and this time it's negative because it's in the opposite direction so it's negative P2 A2 X2 and um, again A2 X2 that's the volume of fluid up here but because of uh, fluid continuity this volume shaded here is the same as this volume up here because the fluid can't expand or compress. So these two V's are the same. So the net amount of work done is just the difference, you know, in this uh, expression here minus the other expression, or we can add them together basically, but remember one of them is in the opposite direction. So the net work is the difference in pressure, P1 minus P2, times the volume of this fluid element in either down here or up here. Now the change in kinetic energy, um, that's one half mv squared at the top minus one half mv squared at the bottom. Because remember what we're doing here is we're sort of modeling this as, as if we're taking this fluid right here and putting it up here. All right, it has a different elevation, it has a different velocity. Um, and so we have one half mv2 squared minus one half mv1 squared. And remember that mass, we can get that from density times volume because density is equal to mass divided by volume. So our delta K is one half rho V times V2 squared minus one half rho V, this is volume again, times V1 squared, where the little V's here are the velocity or the speed of the fluid as it flows through this section of the tube. Then we can look at delta U, which is the change in gravitational potential energy. So we're, you know, the, the delta U is the potential energy of the mass of fluid up here minus the potential energy of the mass of fluid down here. So we have mgy2, where y2 is this height, minus mgy1, where y1 is this height. And again, we can replace the masses with rho density times volume. So we can finally put all this together. Remember that the um, external work done or network, which is this right here, um, is equal to delta K, which is all of this here, plus delta U, which is all of this here. So when we combine all this into one equation and put all the ones on the left and all the twos on the right, we get what is called Bernoulli's equation. And this is the full form of Bernoulli's equation. You can see that this is pressure down here, P1, 
one half rho v1 squared. This is the kinetic energy basically over here. Um, rho times G times Y1, that's sort of the potential energy of the fluid here on the left. And then over on the right side of the uh, equation, we have the pressure um, uh, up here, and then the kinetic energy term up there, and the potential energy term up here. All right. So as I mentioned, you know, this equation is um, fairly complicated. There's a lot of terms um, and a lot of variables in this equation, but we're going to um, make this a little bit easier to work with by um, doing some special cases of this on the next slide. So one of the tricks um, that we can do is uh, to use the fact that since Bernoulli's equation must hold for any two points, x1 and x2, along the streamline or the flow tube, then each side of the equation must be independent of the other, meaning they can only be equal if they are constants. All right, and so this is sort of exploiting a property of mathematical equations when we have lots of, of variables like this. So and we can drop the subscripts and just say that pressure plus one half rho v squared plus rho gy, all right, this is, for example, the left side of Bernoulli's equation, that has to be a constant value. It can't change because on the right side, we're also the same terms with different variables. And so the only way they can all be equal to each other is if they somehow are equal to a constant. And furthermore, we can make this even simpler by assuming that the fluid for now is just going to move horizontally. In other words, our tube or our streamline of fluid is just flowing along a flat surface instead of going up or down. So when we do that, the um, delta y is equal to zero. There's no change in potential energy. So this potential energy term drops out of the equation. So what we're left with is actually something that's very simple. It says that pressure plus one half rho, which is the density of the fluid, times v squared, this is the velocity squared of the fluid, has to be equal to a constant. So think about what this means. If pr this pressure plus this term with the fluid speed v has to be equal to a constant, meaning it can't change, then if the v, if the fluid here speeds up, if v gets bigger, p over here must decrease, it must drop. So this is something that's very surprising about fluids, and it's called the Bernoulli effect. The Bernoulli effect says that when fluid moves faster, the pressure actually decreases, not increases. And that is a, a surprise, and it's a little bit counterintuitive. And remember, fluid is anything that is a liquid or a gas. So this includes air. When air is blown faster, that means the pressure is lower. All right, this is the Bernoulli effect. And you can also explain the uh, Bernoulli effect um, in a very kind of simple way, using Newton's law. Um, if the P1, pressure one, is greater than P2, so you know, if you think about it over here, here's our tube here. If the pressure here is greater than the pressure here, then there's going to be a net force on the, on the fluid pointing to the right, all right? Because P1 points to the right, P2 is going to point back to the left because pressure points in all directions. So this fl this fluid in this region here is feeling a net force to the right, meaning the fluid has to speed up. So the fluid's going to accelerate as it goes through here, all right? So um, let's get back to this, um, this flow tube, though. Here, here we've got fluid flowing in over here um, relatively slowly, okay? And because of fluid continuity, we know the fluid has to speed up as it goes through the narrower section of the tube here. So the fluid is going faster right through here, but that means that the pressure right in here is less than the pressure out here because of the Bernoulli effect. The Bernoulli effect, okay? Sort of a funny name, unless you're used to those kinds of names. But the Bernoulli effect simply says, right, if you've got some fast moving air, right, it's only going to be fast moving, it's going to have less pressure at the same time. So if I blow over the top of this piece of paper, 
I'm not blowing on the paper, but just over the top. What that means is the air moves along really fast along the top. And so since it's moving so fast, it, in some way, to simplify it, you could say it has less time to push down on the paper. And so basically the pressure underneath the paper is the same, but the pre pressure due to the air moving across is less, and so the paper gets held up by the pressure underneath. So we can kick that up a notch and see this on a bigger scale. So if we blow air between the cans, pressure is reduced and they should come together. Just like that. Amazing. Here is kind of a long windsock out of plastic. It's just a giant plastic bag and I sealed off one end. And I'm going to inflate it with one breath using Bernoulli's principle. Well, this is what happens if I try it just using a breath. If I do that, I get about that much air in with two breaths. But Bernoulli's principle says that if I use a different technique, I can fill up the entire bag with one breath. So here it goes. All right. Try that again. So here it goes. I filled up almost the entire bag with one breath. Okay. Now the trick is as follows. So the second time when I was blowing air into it, I was blowing my air into the center right of the bag but because the pressure was reduced there when the point where the air was going by it drew more air in with it so basically one breath kind of was a motivating force that also brought all the other air into the bag so I could just about completely inflate it with one single breath all right and there's even more cool things we can so now do I've got air flowing through this tube watch what happens when I set the ball on top It just sits there and floats until I turn off the air. Now what's going to happen when I turn the air off on when the ball's down here? Should shoot right out, right? It doesn't. In fact, it doesn't even fall out when it's upside down. What keeps it in there? Well, it's because, the, once again, the Bernoulli effect and the air pressure, the air has to flow all the way around the ball, and so basically it keeps the ball in line and check there, and it doesn't allow it to move because the air is moving around so fast that uh, it, it, it keeps it in the slot. All right. We just saw some interesting um, examples of the Bernoulli effect in, in the video that I just showed you, um, including, you know, the, this is kind of something you can do at home too. You can blow the blow air across the piece of paper and watch the paper actually rise up. Um, we also, they also, um, you got to see the uh, ping pong ball um, in the jet of air from a hair dryer. And what's happening there, you know, the reason that ping pong ball stays inside of the uh, column of flowing air is remember that when the air is moving fast, the pressure is lower. So there is a greater pressure on the outside pushing inwards. So as if the ping pong ball tries to fall out of this flowing air, it's going to encounter a higher pressure pushing it back in towards the center. And so that's what sort of captures the ping pong ball and keeps it captive in that air stream. Um, a couple of other uh, very important applications of the Bernoulli effect. Uh, one of them is for airplanes. So when we watch, uh, when we can see the flow of air around the wing of an airplane or even a bird, um, what happens here is the, the, the air has to flow a farther distance over the top of the wing compared to the bottom of the wing because of the different shapes in the top and the bottom. And so the air is actually going faster over the top of the wing compared to underneath the wing where the air is going relatively more slowly. So remember what that means. Slower air means higher pressure. 
Faster air up here means lower pressure. So when we have more pressure under the wing and less pressure above the wing, we get a lift force. So this is what creates lift and allows an airplane to fly. Um, another uh, example is um, for a ball in sports. Um, quite often in sports, the ball is intentionally um, given spin. For example, in tennis, uh, top spin or underspin, which is called slice, is used um, to control the path of the ball. Um, in baseball, a curveball is um, obtained by the pitcher throwing the ball with side spin. And you can see the flow of air here around the spinning ball. And the air has to move faster around this direction of the ball than it does over here. And the result of that is sort of like the wing here. There is a, um, a force going in this direction, which can cause the ball to either rise up or move left or right. It all depends on the direction of the spin here. Another practical example of the Bernoulli effect is uh, the carburetor in your car. Um, the way your car engine's fuel system works is that the fuel comes from your gas tank and it is mixed with air to go into your engine to burn in your uh, cylinders of your car. But the, the way this um, works, especially in the um, older uh, style of carburetors and so forth, is the flow of air moving through here lowers the pressure. Remember, high speed fluids means lower pressure. That lower pressure actually draws the fluid from the tank here into this chamber here. And finally, uh, the Bernoulli effect is also sometimes called the chimney effect. Um, one of the reasons a chimney will draw uh, smoke from down here in the fire is that a wind blowing over the top of the chimney reduces the air pressure above the chimney and that um, the higher pressure inside the house pushes the smoke up and out of the chimney. So that um, is the end of our uh, lectures from chapter 13 on fluids. Um, I will see you guys shortly when we move on to chapter 14 next. Have a great day.